Welcome everybody to, um, to today's um, Thriving Through the Decade of Disruption um, webinar. Uh, whether you're watching it live or whether you're watching this as a recording on YouTube, um, we appreciate you giving us some time to, to come and, and, and I guess watch in on a conversation around, around some, of the, uh, some of the issues that, that, that we're, I guess, talking about in relation to, to this, this period that we're in, which is, which is obviously punctuated very much at the moment with, with COVID-19. But, but what we know is that when we have these things under, when we get these external forces and external stimulus that put us under pressure, put economies under pressure, communities under pressure, it destroys things, but then it creates things, you know. And and what I'm I'm really excited about today is to be having a a, um, a conversation with the Queensland government's um, chief scientist, Paul Birch, um, uh, really around what is the role of science and innovation in terms of taking us to where we need to go to next. Um, what we know is with COVID and with the pandemic, it's just created this level playing field. Um, not not entirely level, absolutely. In fact, not at all entirely level, but it's leveled it off a little bit, and it's it's given everyone the same amount of pressure at the same time. Uh, and so there, there is this opportunity and potentially a, a once in a generation opportunity to, to launch. And so what, what I'm very grateful for Paul to give us some time is to chat about, about where, where can we go from a scientific and an innovation point of view. One of the reasons why we, uh, my, my role at the University of Queensland as entrepreneur in residence is, is to maybe look at the connection between business and industry and science and innovation. Um, and how do we get those two things better connected? Because we know in Australia, we're amazing at science. We're in the top one or 2% globally for science production, science output, but we don't do that well in commercialization and translation of that science. And, and, um, and so Paul, thanks so much for coming on today. I, I know that when we might start off thinking, uh, talking a little bit about the new report that the Queensland government's put out around, uh, around new smarts and, and this sort of ambition, I guess, around what could the future of Queensland look like? Um, but what I want to get straight into, into the meat of this conversation, and give us a little bit of a flavour of what the New Smarts report says, but, but I, I really, want to, really want to move that conversation on to, well, we know that, that we can say amazing things that we want to have. We can have these great ambitions and politicians are great at doing that all the time. But, but what do we need to do differently uh, from a, a soft and a hard infrastructure to be able to embrace uh, a new opportunity that's driven by science and technology? So welcome, Paul, and, uh, and over to you. What do you think? Oh, thanks, Cameron. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, look, uh, you just uh, threw a lot of a lot of issues out there. Uh, so perhaps I'll start a little bit around uh, this new smarts uh, report, and it's really looking at future industries uh, that are well aligned with our R and D uh, strengths here in Queensland. Uh, and there, there's a there, there's a list of these advanced manufacturing, uh, um, and and they they align pretty well with with the roadmaps that the government has has developed. There's the advanced manufacturing roadmap, the aerospace roadmap, uh, the agriculture and food uh, roadmap, the biomedical biofutures. Uh, and I, I'd like to speak a bit about biofutures and some of the legacy in terms of the smart state investments leading on to advanced Queensland investments and putting us in a position where I think we can be globally leading uh, if, we, uh, if we move strategically. Uh, and, and, and the circular economy is another one, defense, uh, and you have some really interesting things going on in defense that you can speak to, uh, obviously, around this as well. The hydrogen uh, uh, strategy, which was was leading in Australia. In a sense, we were the first state to have uh, a hydrogen strategy. We, ours was released even before the Commonwealth uh, strategy led by Alan Finkel uh, and then the METS um, uh, strategy. So we have some really good roadmaps uh, and strategies for uh, moving into uh, advanced uh, advanced mining, for example, uh, renewable energy, and some other uh, aspects of, of uh, this new arts uh, report, which really is examining where we are in terms of the knowledge economy and where we need to go um, to, to, to make it a reality. And as you've mentioned, the COVID-19 uh, situation, the crisis, the global crisis, has really reset so many aspects of society. I mean, we're seeing so much innovation going on uh, across the globe, really. And, and one of the things that uh, I think is, is really remarkable is the amount of collaboration going on. And so we see this unprecedented collaboration between uh, the traditional research provider community and industry. Uh, and we would really like to see that uh, uh, flourish here uh, in Queensland and in and, and, and Australia more generally. Because as you mentioned, the valley of death is, is, is real. There's, there's, uh, you already mentioned we've got, in terms of uh, uh, research output, we're, we're among the top in the world. Uh, but you may know that the Reuters puts out a, a, 
a top 100 list of universities uh, that are uh, top in innovation. Uh, and there's no universities in Australia that are in that top 100 list. Uh, and you may know that a few uh, a week or so ago, the the top 50 universities in the world uh, was w once again, or the top 100 was uh, released. And, and we had five here in Australia, including University of Queensland, which moved up to 46th. Uh, you know, in the world rankings. So, so we have this tremendous research capacity uh, and fantastic minds, but you're absolutely right. Translating uh, that, that research to com uh, commercializable uh, products uh, certainly lags. Yeah. And, and, and so I guess, you know, maybe if we just, if we just get into the, into the meat right up, um, you know, we had, you know, I was around for the smart state strategy, you know, where we, where, you know, I mean, Peter Beatty had an amazing, um, I guess ambition around around technology and around science, and there's a, a huge amount of investment went into into a number of universities around biotechnology and really early, you know, it was market leading stuff. Um, but but in some senses, we we haven't really seen the I guess the 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 intended or the expected sort of explosion in knowledge intensive industries that flowed out of that. Um, and, and I guess I guess I'm just I'm I'm interested in your own personal thoughts around well what what do we need to do differently other than just sort of I mean, just funding and supporting research. Clearly, there's a there's a soft infrastructure piece, or there's a there's a connection point. Um, and the smart uh, the new smarts report does refer to you know, what they've done in Israel and, and obviously what they've done in the US. Um, what do you think of those are those key things that we need to do differently than we we haven't done and maybe we're not doing, but we need to do that can help us change that disparity between science production output. Um, and translation of science into into smart jobs that actually have a have a, a stronger future than the than, than the I guess the, the non knowledge intensive jobs that we that we have a, a prevalence of at the moment. Yeah. So my reflection on smart state and then into advanced Queensland is that uh, th those investments have put us in a position where we can now take advantage of the opportunities uh, that are emerging. So these opportunities were emerging obviously before uh, the current situation, but now they're being accelerated. Uh, there's there's a lot written about how uh, COVID-19 is going to accelerate Industry 4.0 across all sectors. We're seeing innovative business models develop in companies all over the world. As I mentioned, the collaborations, we have Apple and Google collaborating together on, a, on, a, on an app uh, for, for tracking uh, COVID-19. So, so this is unprecedented. And, and so what I think we, uh, so I look at it as a positive. We've, we've invested uh, in capability, both in uh, infrastructure, as well as people and brains. Uh, which is in place and, uh, in, and currently we're looking at strategies for that transition that you're talking about. And I can talk specifically about something I've been very much involved in, and that is advanced biomanufacturing around synthetic biology. Uh, so in my CSRO role, I was uh, an early leader in the synthetic biology future science platform proposal, which is now uh, led by uh, Claudia Vickers, uh, who's uh, a CSRO UQ uh, uh, appointment. And, uh, and Claudia has done a fabulous job at actually uh, bringing uh, to bear the, the vision that was laid out in the proposal and actually exceeding all, all expectations. And what we're doing there, uh, Cameron, is we're, we're, we're looking at a dual strategy of setting an ecosystem uh, to really allow for our homegrown uh, companies to emerge, uh, startups to emerge, but also recruiting companies from overseas uh, that are in the uh, rapid scale up phase uh, and the the beauty of this is that these individuals uh, in the synthetic biology area come in in a very collaborative spirit and, and they're very interested in helping uh, startups uh, in Queensland uh, get established uh, share their uh, what worked for them and what didn't work uh, you know these are companies that went for a fundamental uh, science discovery uh, to billion dollar companies in in five six or nine years I mean, this is just remarkable. And, and we, have, uh, we have a list of these companies that are very, very interested in the value proposition that we, we bring. Uh, one is obviously the access to uh, the, the emerging markets, particularly in Asia, uh, access to the inputs, so sugarcane uh, and, and other agricultural products are important inputs in this industry. Uh, good port infrastructure, uh, R&D tax credit, uh, you know, the, uh, and, and, and the business development fund. So, so all of these things are, are quite attractive to them. Uh, the reason why Australia is attractive is because IP is really important uh, and their protection of things like their uh, data platforms, uh, their AI, ML, 
uh, platforms, et cetera. Uh, they're, they're very concerned about, um, you know, about legal systems and protection of their IP in, in, in many of the countries that they might set up uh, in Asia. So, so we offer a very attractive uh, position. Uh, but in, in terms of getting the infrastructure in place, uh, we're working on a bio incubator and a bio accelerator uh, concept that would go uh, into the Bogger Road uh, precinct development. I don't know if you're familiar with what's going on there, but there's, you have the Cross River Rail, you know, which is a $5.4 billion investment, uh, and the, the major stations are, uh, are going to uh, see some of that investment in terms of actually improving uh, the situation of where those stations are. Uh, but we also have the, um, we also have the city deal a negotiation going on with the Commonwealth. And the idea there is uh, to really get a, a bio incubator at scale in place uh, and a bio accelerator. And these, these are uh, big gaps that we currently have here in Australia in terms of uh, areas that we can uh, bring industries in that can access infrastructure, um, common infrastructure, uh, so that they can develop uh, their, their industries uh, that they would be unable to do otherwise. And, and I've visited uh, many bio incubators out in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, it's different models. Uh, I've met with Australian companies out there. There's one called uh, Scaled uh, Biolabs, uh, which is actually a, originally uh, started here in Queensland. It's, a, it's a, uh, an individual, uh, Drew Titmarsh, who got his PhD at the University of Queensland, developed a a technology where it uses uh, microfluidics and, and 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 cell culture to to actually look at uh, at, at improving uh, uh, cells and and he teamed up with a uh, astro astrophysicist to develop the AI ML platform so they also have a a technology services component uh, so they have the hardware but they also have the, a software component and and Drew told me he would love to move back to Australia but he would need a bio incubator of the nature that we're actually talking about, you yeah, know, because wow. they, so, so these are the kinds of things. We, and, and so we, if we get that uh, incubator set up, we have an ecosystem, uh, you know, young scientists uh, uh, have a lot of passion. Uh, you know, if you look at the, if you look at a lot of these startups in the, in, in, in synthetic biology, uh, they're just driven by young PhDs uh, getting out, starting up companies um, to really address global challenges. Uh, so things like sustainability, uh, you know, the transition from fossil fuels to bio-based uh, products. Uh, and, and, and really this get, uh, feeds into the circular economy. And so they're really passionate about, about that. But it also means we have to think about how do we provide uh, uh, renewable energy sources for them because, you know, they, they, they're very concerned about their environmental footprint. And, and so, you know, bringing them to Queensland and and looking at non-renewable uh, energy sources would be a significant disadvantage. So, so something like our high hydrogen energy strategy really then becomes integrated with something like our uh, advanced bio uh, strategy. Yeah, look, they, they, you've raised some really interesting points which I wanna dig into a little bit. And, and I think that the synthetic biology and a lot of people maybe, if they're not scientists, they maybe don't understand what that means. But, but one, one thing I'm interested in is, is this idea around this, this sort of the, the future being a, uh, a blending of the past and the future. So using new technology to, to leapfrog new technology in new, new industries. And so, you know, we know we have a, a very strong food industry, a very strong mining industry, and, 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 and synthetic biology is really interesting because, um, because we know that the world is growing. We know there's an extra billion or two people, you know, coming through in the next 10 years. And we need to feed them, but we're running out of planet. Um, and, and, you know, I know I've had Phil Moore on here, you know, from uh, Main Sequence Ventures a few weeks ago. You know, they invested in, in V2 Food, you know, the alternative meat burger, which yes. they've done with Hungry Jacks. And, and more interestingly, and this is one you're probably a lot closer to, which is Clara Foods, um, which is making, and, and maybe you could unpack this better than I can around, you know, what does, what does that, what does synthetic biology offer? You know, for we've got enormous potential as a food producer. Um, you know, we've got clean and green, we've got proximity to markets, we've got good stable, you know, industrial relations, good secure ports and, and infrastructure. Um, so, so how do we then take, I guess, an industry like the food industry, which has typically been low value, commodity oriented, how do we then use technology to leapfrog that? And maybe if, if, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether you know a little bit more about Clara Foods, but talking about where do we go with that? And what does that opportunity look like for us? Yeah, look, the opportunity is uh, fantastic. So through TIQ, uh, Trade Investment Queensland, uh, we've been uh, interacting deeply with uh, companies in the San Francisco Bay Area that uh, really see the value of the value proposition that Queensland offers that I mentioned before. 
Uh, and, and there's a number of companies. One's called Bolt Threads. Uh, and they actually make spider silk uh, uh, with yeast. And, and spider silk is an amazing, uh, uh, has amazing properties. It's as strong as steel, yet it's obviously flexible and it breathes. And so, uh, you know, it's, what they've done is they originally entered the high-end uh, fabric market in, in Europe. So the designers are coming in with, here they have a, a, a renewable, uh, instead of, you know, the fossil fuel-based uh, textiles. Uh, and just just amazing market that they're, they're, they're growing there. there there's a, a spider silk company out of Germany called uh, AM Silk, and, and they're making running shoes for Adidas that comes with a a packet of enzymes that you mix up in a solution and dissolve your shoes at the end of life uh, in your in your uh, sink with uh, you know, in your kitchen or your or your laundry and so just amazing things happening there uh, and and these companies uh, see the market uh, very significant uh, growth particularly in, in in the emerging markets uh, the food area is, is fantastic to think about and that's one that we're giving a lot of thought to because there's a lot of value uh, in terms of these alternate uh, protein uh, companies. Uh, so we've been uh, talking with Impossible Foods, for example, which you may know the Impossible Burger's not here yet in Australia, but will be soon. They've, uh, hired, they're have they in the process of hiring 12 individuals and, and setting up some production here in Australia. Uh, you've talked about B2, you know, uh, there's Beyond Meat. Um, a lot of these, these are around. And I think the, the real uh, interest there is that, uh, you know, people are going to continue to want beef into the future. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but the cost of beef relative to these alternate proteins is going to uh, be, get quite high and the, and the alternate proteins are going to get quite low. And so if you're thinking about the emerging markets, we have two, two things. One was, you're absolutely right. We don't have enough protein. We're not, we're not going to be able to produce enough protein uh, through our uh, traditional production systems. So these alternate systems become very important. Uh, they do reduce the footprint of agriculture uh, dramatically. Uh, and uh, they often, they potentially offer uh, alternate health benefits. Uh, and so, you know, while some of the companies haven't really focused on that so much, others are, and, and even the ones that haven't are, they're thinking about how can we uh, actually engineer these uh, alternate proteins uh, that, go, that will be future foods uh, in ways that uh, optimize uh, the, your gut microbiome for specific uh, health outcomes, for example. So, so you're absolutely right. This is, this is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, if you look at polling, so, so there's some significant surveys that have been conducted around these alternate uh, proteins. Not surprisingly, the Asians are, and, and, and Indian, and so in the subcontinent, they're very open uh, to thinking about alternate meats. In fact, uh, 65 and 67% uh, respectively in terms of uh, uh, India and China uh, are very much uh, interested in in these alternate uh, uh, protein sources, uh, these alternate meats, uh, versus 35% in the U.S. Uh, although the, even in the U.S., if you look at the data, you drill down into the data, there's a demographic divide. So so young people are much more accepting of of these alternate uh, proteins, uh, and it's 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 a global uh, uh, footprint thing in terms of uh, climate and and uh, degradation of the planet, but it's also a health uh, benefit. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, the beef industry in Argentina, which is one of the most carnivorous <laughs> uh, cultures in the world, uh, six out of ten would consider going to the alternate meats, and most of that's driven by economics. Because, as you probably know, they're going through a very difficult economic period. Yeah, and, and so look, I, I mean, for me, that just that just makes me really excited because I think. Not only have we got the, uh, I guess, the credentials and the reputation for, as a food producer and, and a mining producer, and we could have the same conversation about mining and, and technology Absolutely. and mining. Um, but that makes me tremendously excited because we've got the, the fundamentals for, in some ways, an unfair competitive advantage, you know, a, a, an advantage that, that other people can't replicate. Um, yeah, and, and absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, when I started talking to these companies and told them we produced five tons of sugar a year, they had no idea, you know, they just don't think of us uh, sitting where we, where we sit and being so tropical and, and, so, and subtropical. And that really gives us that competitive advantage, uh, as well as, as I mentioned, the vicinity uh, where we sit in the world, uh, free trade agreements, which uh, the U.S. doesn't have with a lot of Asian com countries. And, and the brand recognition is going to hold up. So as you know, uh, Australian agricultural products have unprecedented uh, brand recognition in, in many of these countries. 
Uh, and as you probably also know, in some of them, there's a, it's a problem because uh, there's a lot of fraud uh, that goes on there and food provenance is becoming a real uh, critical issue for us in Australia. I think there are some estimates that as many as much as 50% of the agricultural products that say they're, uh, they're from Australia that are sold in China are not actually uh, produced in Australia. For, so it's a big problem, but, but it's a good problem to have because we can solve that one through provenance and blockchain and some other things. Um, but that, that brand recognition is, is really there and it's going to be there for the, our fermented foods as well. Yeah, and I think, um, I remember I was in, in China 15 years ago on a government mission looking in the early days of exporting fruit into, into, um, into China. And, and, and we saw these, um, over there, we, we saw these apples that had stickers on them that said Australian mango, um, you know, <laughs> um, which, which was, you know, I guess a, a hilarious example of, of this fraud thing. And I think, again, the conversation I had with Lan Kemp last week, you know, with what she's done with Everledger around that provenance of diamonds, you know, and using the yes. technology in the mining industry. So getting these very traditional companies that applying a technology layer over that industry to be able to then exploit the opportunity. I think that that's what really excites me and whether it's food or mining or, or cyber security, um, I think the ability to, to actually get where we have critical mass, you know, we have a big food industry, we have a big mining industry. Um, we have a great brand reputation, great proximity. And, and I think the missing link has always been the technology overlay, the knowledge intensity and applying that to these existing industries. And, and I think what you outlined with the Bogger Road strategy and, and I guess University of Queensland, you know, is really well positioned because, because I, I guess we're the, we're the leading university in Queensland and one of the top three in, you know, in Australia. And, and we have this great, um, this great scientific pedigree. Um, and I guess what we're just hoping to do over this next, really what we have to do really over the next few years is to fuse all of those capabilities. And, and look, to me, that's a challenge um, because our, our, a lot of our industries are multinationals and so their R&D is done overseas. Um, and the startup sector has really, has really struggled to actually you know, replicate what they've done in, in Tel Aviv and, and they've done in London and in, and in Silicon Valley. So what are you thinking around, or what do you think the government's thinking around? How do we, how do, we do that? How do we, two, two things really, I guess. One of which is how do we get better connection with big companies and get them in, in, you know, in, in folding um, this innovation and how do we get better support of, of startups and how do we get the exploitation of these things happening better? Yeah, you know, so one of the things I think is, is really smart investment by governments, right? Uh, so, so one thing that I'm very uh, familiar with from my time in the US is the Human Genome Project. Uh, and you may know the Human Genome Project was a, was a very ambitious project that started in 1990 that uh, was thought to uh, it was going to take 15 years to complete at five billion dollars at the time, and uh, it actually was completed in 13 years at three and a half billion dollars. Uh, but in 2013, there was a, a, a Patel uh, did a, a fundamental analysis in terms of the return on investment, and the return on investment was 178 times. Uh, so in 2013, one trillion dollars worth of economic benefit had been generated from the Human Genome Project. And you can just imagine uh, all the things we're talking about in terms of synthetic biology, that wouldn't exist. Our ability to detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater that UQ and CSRO did in, uh, uh, in a partnership, you know, none of these uh, capabilities would, uh, or none of these opportunities would exist without those capabilities that, that came out of the Human Genome Project. And so, uh, you know, this is an example of where if you, if you think uh, quite strategically about where to invest, uh, the, the opportunities uh, to grow and to get these huge multiples back on your investment uh, are there. And so in the synthetic biology area or advanced biomanufacturing more generally, we're, we're really thinking about uh, contract manufacturing facilities. So just to give you an idea about the relative uh, potential demand and Clara Foods is part of this discussion as well. Uh, you know, I've, I've been talk in conversations with about um, almost a half, a, uh, almost two dozen um, synthetic biology companies. Uh, not all in the U.S. So one of my favorites is is a, is a company based in Finland called Solar Foods, and they've they've engineered a uh, a microorganism that uses hydrogen as an energy source, fixes CO2 from the atmosphere, and they've engineered it to make a protein that they call solian. And it's a wow. so it comes out like a flower that's about 50% protein. And just to put that in perspective, you know, uh, flour wheat flour is only 25% uh, to 27% protein. So it's double the protein in, of wheat flour. And, and they've got a model, a business model of scaling up and producing all kinds of alternate 
alternate meats, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, so, so we're talking to all, all these really exciting companies, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just fascinating uh, what those opportunities are, but this contract manufacturing facility. So TIQ did some work around uh, just a half a dozen of the companies that um, we were in conversations with in terms of what they're, and, and, and they were the ones that were most uh, interested in a three to five year period of setting up production facilities here in, in Queensland. Uh, and just to, again, put it in perspective, uh, they had indicated, those six had indicated they needed about 100,000 liters uh, capacity um, and fermentation capacity, aerobic fermentation capacity. Uh, and then Clara comes over the top of that and said, they, they need 100,000. So, so that's 200,000 uh, liters. And, and to put, again, put that in perspective, the, the most we have anywhere in Australia is in Mackay, and it's that uh, pilot plant facility that QUT operates, and that's 10,000 liters, and, and I'm told only about 1,000 of that actually operates. So, so there's this tremendous opportunity to get, um, to, to, for private uh, public partnerships, you know, to get these facilities up that would actually uh, seal the deal with a lot of these, these companies that, that uh, see the rest of the value proposition being real, but obviously, uh, they, they have pushed back in terms of, you know, um, obviously the investors uh, here in Australia just aren't the same as the U.S. One of the reasons why uh, Drew Titmarsh's companies in, in, in San Francisco is because, you know, he went there to gain uh, the venture capital for, for the company that he, he, he was starting up. And so that, that's changing slowly. As you know, you spoke with Phil Morrow, as you mentioned, and uh, you know, so uh, main sequence ventures. And I mean, we're seeing some some change there, but it's still a pretty dramatic difference. Yeah. And uh, and before I go on, if, if any any people who are watching have got some questions, just drop that down into the Q and A session, and, and we'll try and get to them soon. But um, I think that's that's really exciting. I mean, if we've I'm, I mean, because I know we've got say the sugar industry, which is in some senses in a world of heading into a world of pain because you've got this sugar tax and you've got you know carbohydrates and 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 sugar as an issue, but and I know the sugar industry is grappling with what their future looks like. And, and I think this idea of, you know, could we convert sugar, you know, into, into milk, synthetic biology produced milk using large fermenters. And, and so for me, that, again, that, that just fills me with great excitement. But one of the things I think that I'm really interested in, and I guess somewhat, I guess we have a vested interest at the University of Queensland in, in young people, uh, particularly in students, um, as to how do we provide, how do we almost create or, or in some senses curate these opportunities and, and utilizing this great resource we have in young people, you know, the, the, the millennials and the Gen Zs who, who are incredibly optimistic, who are, who are very much passionate about the environment and about, you know, things that are sustainable. Uh, we've just recently launched a new initiative. In fact, only this week with the Australian Defence Force, with the Defence AI Centre, where we're actually getting some of our masters and MBA students to work with defence on, on artificial intelligence technologies to try and work out, well, how can we grow some of our own sovereign capability and one of the things to do that is we need to understand well what is the problem um and, and do that through through a lot of customer discovery so next semester i'm going to be teaching a couple of courses where some of our students will be working with defense um not only defense as a as a problem owner but also startups and, and researchers as solution providers to try and really understand how do we connect problem and solution better um, and it, what's your thinking in terms of how do we how do we utilize this this younger generation and you know universities and even high school students like they've done overseas? Yeah, so you know I've um, I've had a history of connections with DARPA and, and the way DARPA operates, for example, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency within the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, and that's a spectacular model for actually defining challenges and putting calls out for people to come forward with innovative solutions to those challenges. Uh, and then they end up being uh, a customer. So, so as, the, as the company uh, scales up and also pivots in terms of uh, their production, uh, there's, there's, there's opportunities. So, so Spider Silk, for example, that came out of a DARPA uh, uh, grant to, to come up with uh, alternate armor, body armor uh, to Kevlar. Uh, and you know, so the companies that developed the Spider Silk uh, armor, they, they had a, a customer because the Department of Defense uh, uh, purchased it uh, early on as they then uh, diversified into the garment industry and, uh, and some other uh, aspects. So, so I think this is, this is a really important aspect. And, um, uh, and I think governments, again, can be customers, right? So to really start, uh, if, if you had 
uh, startups coming in uh, and, and really addressing specific solutions to challenges uh, that have a, a measurable uh, impact uh, uh, for Queensland or, or for Australia. And then the government becomes, you know, a customer, an early customer uh, to ensure that, um, that that company has, has the ability to grow uh, and then scale up and, and, and pivot their markets. Uh, a, a bit going forward. So I, I really like that model. Um, I see the opportunity being reset with the COVID situation to be uh, absolutely spectacular. I mean, we're, we're looking at uh, supply chain uh, security and that's, the, that's discussion's not gonna go away. It's, it's obviously happening globally, but it's very, very live across Australia, uh, giving us opportunities to rethink our manufacturing base and particularly in light of uh, advanced manufacturing, which uh, can bring production costs down uh, and again, really accelerating uh, the adoption of industry 4.0 across, uh, across sectors. And so I, I see this a tremendous opportunity uh, for, for young people to come in uh, and, 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 and get these ideas uh, uh, actually uh, into uh, trying to, to solve solutions. And I'll just give you an example. I'm, I'm, I'm leading up a, an effort around a think tank. And, and the, the idea originally was mainly uh, working with uh, Queensland Health uh, back in March when the outlook for uh, the COVID situation didn't look very good. You know, we were predicting 10 to as many as 100,000 deaths across Australia. Uh, and so we were really thinking about uh, what are the challenges going to be in terms of moving uh, PPE around, uh, actually getting man PPP, PPE uh, manufactured. What about ventilators? We might have to be moving ventilators around. We might uh, be uh, s having to strategically decide what patients get moved and, and when they get moved so it's early enough uh, for, for proper treatment. Uh, and then, of course, we've done so well uh, as a state and a nation uh, that that kind of uh, urgency went away. Uh, but the idea uh, continued to develop around there are challenges in the recovery phase that if they were solved would have the greatest impact. And so we're hoping to develop an innovation challenge uh, process uh, through the think tank and going out to proponents. Uh, uh, we've identified 30 challenges uh, from input across uh, all of Queensland government. And uh, the think tank will be narrowing that down to just a handful uh, of challenges that we would go out to proponents with, uh, to respond to with solutions. Uh, and then uh, obviously, going back to the departments that align with those uh, major challenges and, and the greatest impact, as well as uh, Commonwealth uh, funding opportunities uh, to really get uh, these ideas, these solution ideas uh, into, into reality. And, and a lot of that would be commercial products, right? If you think about the bio, divert, uh, I'm sorry, the bio uh, security space, uh, it's something that uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite involved with and we've been, we've been talking about this for years in terms of the amount of, uh, of risk that uh, our, our, our that biosecurity actually poses to trillions of dollars of assets just here in in uh, in, in Queensland, uh, but it's really hard to get traction in, until something happens, and there's a lot of interest, and then once it goes away, the interest goes away. Uh, so, I think this will reset sustained interest in in biosecurity into the into the future. Uh, you know, we, we know that. Um, that uh, infectious disease experts and especially disease ecologists have been predicting for years uh, that we're uh, on the verge of uh, more frequent pandemics uh, that are emerging from the global change story. That is habitat destruction, uh, loss of biodiversity, uh, increased uh, human uh, wildlife contact. Uh, and and it's, we've actually been quite fortunate that we've dodged the bullet this, uh, up till now, right? So we had SARS, uh, but SARS wasn't very infectious, luckily. Uh, otherwise, it would have uh, uh, been very uh, damaging uh, to, to global health and, and economies. Uh, we had MERS, and, and now we have uh, COVID-19. And, and, and you know, SARS-CoV-2 is much more um, transmissible uh, than these others. And it's, it's one that, again, these scientists have been uh, predicting for many years. And it's going to continue to happen. What can we learn from this so that we're prepared for the future? Uh, what can we learn uh, and, and what problems can we solve uh, that will help us through the transition period as we open up our interstate borders, we go back to uh, opening up our international borders, welcoming our, our foreign students back as well as uh, tourists. Uh, you know, how are we going to be prepared to uh, be able to do that and get the economy uh, back up, uh, and, but do it in the, through the lens of, of, of making sure we ensure public safety? Yeah. 
That's great. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share a screen just for a moment, just to, um, uh, just to bring a notice uh, from the sponsors. So. Um, just want to bring everyone who's watching attention to a, a great series we've got. Um, next week, we've got um, uh, Diane Han Hanna, who's uh, talking about um, around how people can, can, I guess, deal with mental health issues that might have come through quarantine and through the COVID restrictions. And then the week after that, we've got, uh, I've got a great interview with Shay Kwaba, who's a design anthropologist uh, who works with Suncorp to help them develop new products um, and make sure the products actually solve the right problem. Um, and, and also what we've seen, it's been quite interesting at the University of Queensland level, our, our MBA program has had more interest than we've ever seen before. And it, it's an excellent MBA. Um, I, I teach in, the, in the, uh, the capstone program around entrepreneurship. But um, one, one thing that I think is interesting is that we're seeing this increased interest in people looking to reskill and get themselves ready for new, new opportunities and new experiences. So we've got a range of professional development, short courses. Uh, we've launched this new Masters of Leadership and Service Innovation, which is really helping people think about the future and, and what does service innovation look like? Because I know, you know software as a service and, and, and the service economy is growing. And then the Masters of Entrepreneurship and Innovation are programs. Um, and so you can find out more about them on, um, on, uh, on our website. Um, and so I guess what I wanna, in fact, I've got a couple of questions here, which I might just put to you, Paul. Um, Gloria's asked this question, uh, you know, how can we better incentivize uh, and provide linkages with industry and government social enterprise initiatives that have sustainable goals of their cure at their core because i mean obviously we've got great technology but but some of these things are, are potentially social enterprises have you got any thoughts or is the government thinking about social enterprises and and incentivizing and supporting those sort of things uh yeah there's a lot of thought and discussion going on there both at, at the state as, as, as well as at the commonwealth level um it's clear that uh you know a lot of the challenges that we face uh, we actually have technologies to address uh, but a lot of it is actually getting uh, societal buy-in uh, to, to a lot of these uh, challenges. So, so the, and, and, and look, we're part of the other part of this disruption that we're seeing now coming out of, uh, uh, in terms of social injustice, uh, you know, we're looking at some social tipping points that are emerging globally uh, very rapidly. And I, and, and I think that that's going to coalesce with, with the technological tipping points. Uh, as well as the process uh, tipping points, and really uh, lead to opportunities to 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 grow uh, new industries uh, that are much more environmentally friendly. They're much more uh, uh, s socially acceptable, and uh, but we we just have to integrate all of those uh, uh, aspects uh, in into our thinking and and also into our implementation strategies. Yeah, and I also think in that area, it's it's important to realize that 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 we do need new models everywhere. So, you know, even the social enterprise and, and charities, you know, are having to rethink their strategy, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, we don't necessarily need everyone to have for-profit companies, but we can't have organizations that are for loss. And so this idea of profit for purpose, I see, I think this is a real opportunity around, you know, the, 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 um, the circular economy is one area where I think there's enormous opportunity. We've got all this waste food and waste energy and waste everything, waste clothing, um, so I think, again, applying innovation to those things and having these, these hybrid models where you have maybe an ability to generate income, um, but then you, you, you're channeling that for a positive purpose, for you know, a profit for purpose. Um, I think there's a really exciting opportunity in that. Oh, yes, I do as well. And I, I think the other opportunity out of this reset is to really re begin to rethink our economic systems more, more broadly. So, so I'm a... Uh, a student of steady state economics uh, because the, the idea of continual growth is uh, obviously not sustainable. Uh, and there, there's, a, there's a book that was written from the first uh, international conference of uh, steady state economics, which was held at uh, University of Leeds, I think in 2011, it's called Enough is Enough. Uh, and uh, it really lays out a, an optimistic future. So, so you can actually see what jobs of the future uh, would look like uh, in, a, in, a, in an economy that's not uh, based on continual growth and, and, and mega consumption. Uh, and, and, and it also looks at you know, how do you change the institutional structures as, as well as the uh, banking uh, uh, systems uh, globally. And I, I think this is an opportunity, exactly what you're saying there, is that there are opportunities to make profits, uh, but also have really uh, social good outcomes. And that that's going to become more critical into the future. And these synthetic biology companies, they're all motivated to save the world. And, yeah. you know, and yet, you know, some of them are 
pulling in a billion dollars a year already uh, through their products. So, so, so you, you mentioned milk, you know, we've been uh, in discussions with uh, Perfect Day, which is a, uh, they make milk. Uh, uh, they have yeast that makes milk. They've engineered yeast that makes uh, cow's milk. Uh, they're a California based company. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, what you can imagine uh, in terms of product development uh, that solve uh, societal problems as well as the environmental problems and at the same time uh, provide value, right? So, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, this whole, if we just think about just synthetic biology, Queensland's a food state, you know, we're the biggest beef producer, you know, huge sugar producer, horticulture. Um, what, what's the next step? Are we, we going to see a uh, hundred thousand liter, you know, synthetic biology fermenting capacity in, in Queensland in the next couple of years and what has to happen for that to happen? Yeah, so what's gonna to have to happen is we're gonna to have to get investors. And uh, so we're looking at different models of uh, enticing uh, contract manufacturers uh, with the data that we've collected from the companies and you know, making, we just have to seal some of these deals in terms of the companies making commitments, but they're not gonna make commitments unless they know they have the infrastructure. So it's a, kind of the cart and the horse uh, activity. It's, it's, it's a little bit challenging, uh, but look, there's a strong will uh, I think uh, there's a lot of cross-government uh, interest uh, in making this work. That we we know that you know that there's the the demand, and it's just a matter of uh, meeting that demand, and and uh, you know uh, enabling a whole new industry to flourish. And and that's why I mentioned the Human Genome Project because it was a deliberate strategic investment um, in in something that where the outcome uh, was 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 quite clear to some people. It wasn't to everyone, right? So, uh, you know, as I went through the Human Genome Project, a lot of people are, are, are unaware. It's the U.S. Department of Energy that ended up being the primary driver. Uh, the National Institutes of Health came on after it was clear that it was going to be successful. Uh, and because in the early, what happened in that, in the, in, in the early workshops, uh, they were developing the, the roadmap. And, and the NIH, a lot of the NIH people came out and said, I, I, I don't, there, there's no health here. This is all technology development. And the Department of Energy said, well, we can do de technology development. But, but the people in DOE that kept it pushing it uh, against uh, a lot of um, uh, strong headwinds saw the end point. They saw a transformation in, 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 in health. They saw a transformation in just how, we, uh, how biology was going to work in the world and, and how we're going to enter this century, which is the life science century. And, and I see Queensland per uh, perfectly uh, positioned for this. But yeah. again, thinking about how we invest uh, smart and, and think about innovative uh, public private partnerships potentially, I think is going to be really important going forward. Yeah. Look, Paul, that's been a fascinating conversation and, and, and I'm, I feel incredibly optimistic and I think we've got, I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, through Smart State, you know, and now through Advanced Queensland and the investment that we have in our research infrastructure, we, we've just got to try and, and do that final push, which is that translation piece, which which I think, you know, you're talking about some of the right things, you know, that, that we need to pull into place to see that, that translation into, into jobs. And I think it, it could be that this whole COVID thing, which has been, which is a disaster, really. I mean, it's, it's caused so much pain and grief. Um, but, but I think combining that with the millennial and the Gen Z generation and the rest of us Gen Xs um, who are still optimistic, I, I, think, I think we have this opportunity to really start to, to create a new future for us. And I think, I, I think, we're, we're incredibly lucky to be in this country. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work with, uh, and I'm sure the University of Queensland is work with the Queensland government as to how we actually start to execute that. And so appreciate the work you're doing. And, um, and, and Yeah, look, I agree with everything you've said, Cameron. It's just, a, you know, out of the grief and pain uh, is coming tremendous uh, optimism. Uh, and I think the will to get this right is, is greater than it ever has been in terms of bridging that gap. Uh, and certainly, you know, the shock to the universities based on lost uh, subsidy of research through the, uh, through the foreign students uh, is really changing, the, I think, the playing field in terms of thinking about new partnerships going forward between yeah. universities and industry. And, and so I, th I think we're at a, we're at a juncture that's uh, going to be a, really a, a positive one in the future. Yeah, no, you're right. And so look, appreciate your time, Paul. I know you're very busy and, and uh, appreciate your leadership in this science area and look forward to um, 
to seeing how we can collectively as the, the, the tribe, the village that we are in Queensland to actually grow the pie, you know, and, um, and very excited about, uh, about being on that journey. So thanks for your time and, and thanks for your generosity in sharing your thoughts with us. Yeah, well, thanks, Cameron. Thanks for having me on.